it is our pleasure to have uh, Dudu Biron here. Uh, Dudu started his studies in uh, Jerusalem in the Hebrew University. He studied uh, math and uh, sorry, <laughs> physics and computer science. Uh, he then moved here for a <coughs> PhD study where he did biophysics and contracting cells here at uh, Elisha's lab. Uh, then he went for a postdoc in Massachusetts, in Harvard, in, in uh, Brandeis, where he started to look at the nervous system, at the brain of the worm, of all creatures, and he will tell us why. And, uh, and since then, I think uh, six years, or he's in the physics uh, department in uh, Chicago University, where he's looking at, at uh, sleep in worms. So, <coughs> do worms sleep and why? And, and uh, I, I guess this is one of the, the one of the more interesting questions in uh, biology, just just even uh, for its universality, because <coughs> about any any animal that we know, from very small to very large, sleeps, and and to a large extent, we have no idea why. So, so it's one of the great mysteries of of, uh, of animals of life, and uh, we'll be happy to hear about it. So. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and thank you for the introduction. It's um, Strictly speaking, those statements were somewhat controversial, quite controversial, but I'll stand by them and, um, okay, we'll see how this goes. So anyway, uh, I want to talk about perturbations to worm sleep, and I'm going to uh, introduce the worm, and going to introduce sleep very briefly. Generally, the structure of the talk is going to be as follows. I'm going to go through a brief introduction. I'm going to do grave injustices both to worms and to sleep, but you're going to get the gist of it. Um, then I'm going to talk about weak perturbations to worm sleep and what they can teach us about uh, homeostatic compensation, a term which I will define. Uh, moving forward, I'll talk about stronger perturbations and the unfortunate consequences <laughs> of uh, sleep deprivations for worms uh, and, and some conclusions. So uh, I'll start by saying that sleep is, like Ophel said, universal to first order at least in the animal kingdom. It is essential if sleep is completely deprived, animals die, the 100% probability. Uh, and it's mysterious. Uh, we don't know the answers, or rather there are various heatedly debated answers to questions that seems like, like textbook questions. These are, text, these are uh, questions that you can explain to kids, to five-year-old kids. So do really all animals sleep, or are there exceptions? Is sleep some kind of organizing principles for biological, for, for living matter? Or is it just an evolutionary coincidence? Is sleep predominantly for the brain? The answer is no, but to what extent no? Are there other tissues, are there other subsystems of the, of the body that sleep is very important for? Conceivably, can we think of a sleepless animal? Can we, at least in theory, design one? Or is it just an impossibility? Is there a, a law of nature that we will, in some sense, break? Or in other words, why? Why do animals sleep? The metaphysical question. Now, the interest of physicists in sleep actually has a, a rich history. Uh, I won't recount it. Just a prominent example is uh, Seymour Benzer, who early as in career was a solid state physicist. He worked on germanium crystals uh, that eventually led to the development of the transistor. But uh, he moved on to found the field of neurogenetics, which is the search for the hardware, usually molecular hardware, that underlies the activity of neural circuits and behavior. Uh, and he had an early fascination with sleep. He looked for uh, flies with sleep defects. That led him to a great discovery, which is a, a little different than, than his interests kind of shift, but that's a different story. So worms, and I didn't really tell you what a worm is yet, but um, let's start with the fact that they exhibit uh, all the hallmarks of sleep that we are aware of. Sleep is a quiescent behavior. Most animals, not every animal, move less when they sleep. It's reversible. If there is nothing I can do to wake you up, you are not asleep to begin with. Okay? Uh, most animals exhibit characteristic postures when they sleep. 
they exhibit something called sensory gating, which, uh, as shown here, basically means that external stimuli that usually grab your attention when you're awake will not do so when you are asleep. They're diverted or ignored. Uh, of course, some stimuli have to grab your attention. Otherwise, that would be, evolutionarily speaking, unfortunate. Um, homeostatic compensation I'll talk about in a bit. And vulnerability, uh, sleep is a period where disruptions or disturbances that otherwise are benign, um, if they disrupt sleep, uh, the consequences are unfortunate. And these references here basically show you that very recently, mostly in the last couple of years, uh, all of these characteristics have been observed in the worm. Humans sleep quite a bit. The red line here depicts uh, <coughs> the total amount of sleep in hours, on average, uh, of humans as a function of age, from infancy to old age. And uh, you can see, uh, A, the number of hours is pretty large, B, this downward trend, which extends way beyond humans. It's a pretty universal trend. And it's been noticed quite a few decades ago. This is a reproduction of data from 1966. Uh, and immediately it sprung to mind the hypothesis that, spring, that uh, sleep uh, is closely related to development and specifically that sleep probably has an important function in the development and the proper development of the nervous system. So as a, a side remark, um, not letting kids or infants sleep enough is basically the worst thing that you can do. Uh, think about it before you wake your child up for school next time. Um, <laughs> The nematodes, the elegans, finally, uh, is the simplest model organism in biology. Uh, it is about a millimeter long. It's about as thick as a hair. And uh, it has simple genetics, a wonderful experimental tool. It has a simple brain. It's optically transparent. So you can look right through it without disturbing it with here bright field microscopy or if you have markers with fluorescent microscopy. Its nervous system has only 302 neurons. And the morphology of them, how they're organized in space, is, is, is well known. So 302 for a nervous system is an extremely small number compared with the 80 billion neurons on average that a person has, or even the 150,000 neurons that a fruit fly has. All right, so the worm has 302 neurons. And each of these neurons, what we know about it is its location in the worm, its morphology, who it's connected to, so the connections. And all this data is available online in databases and models. And if you're interested in a particular behavior or a neuron or a circuit, you can go online and you can choose your neuron of interest and you can start your study uh, from this publicly available body of knowledge. The other thing we want to know about the worm is that it has a simple and short life cycle and it sleeps at least four times during its development. It may also sleep as an adult. We're not going to go into that. Basically, after the worm hatches from an egg, it goes through four larval stages, L1, L2, L3, L4. Each of them lasts about 12 hours. The last two to three hours of each larval stage is called lethargis, L1 lethargis to L4 lethargis, and that is worm sleep. Uh, it ends with a molt. So at the end of each larval stage, the worm sheds its cuticle, much like a, a snake sheds its skin. And this two to three hour period Specifically, L4 lethargis, uh, you know, is basically what we study. So this is what it looks like. This is the same worm on the left and the right. On the left, it's awake. On the right, it's asleep. You can see that this worm, the awake worm, is moving. It's curvy. It's wiggling its head, meaning it's eating. This worm is much flatter. It alternates between bouts of complete quiescence, where it's frozen, the movie is running, uh, and bouts of somewhat erratic motion, and often it assumes this characteristic L-shaped posture, uh, which is characteristic of worm sleep. Uh, what you can see here is that there's also sensory gating, if we perturb this worm, uh, and homeostatic compensation. So that's the subject of the talk today. All right, so what is homeostatic compensation in the context of sleep? Uh, the, the simplest manifestation is that you, you can think about it as a restoring force, as a spring. The more you keep yourself awake uh, during normal periods where you're supposed to sleep, the more tired you are, the stronger the restoring force, you know, back to sleep. So if you skip a night of sleep, 
Uh, next time you allow yourself to fall asleep, you will fall asleep faster. You will be harder to wake up. You'll sleep deeper. Uh, and you'll probably sleep a little longer than normal, right, to compensate. Uh, of course, homeostatic compensation also operates on a finer scale. This is a cartoon of uh, normal human sleep. <coughs> and it doesn't really matter what each color designates, but the different colors do designate different states of sleep. Sleep is not just one thing. In humans, different stages, and during a normal night, they're supposed to cycle. And if one of these stages gets disrupted, then it is specifically compensated for. All right? So uh, if you know something about the structure of human sleep, you can study homeostasis in human sleep, and the same applies for the worm. In order to study homeostatic compensation uh, in worms, uh, we have to know what they do, what they behave like. All right? And so, uh, experimentally, what does it mean to uh, know what worms do? You take movies. You take long movies of the worm. This is a snapshot from a movie. This is a worm that's really misbehaving. They don't usually do this thing. Uh, and, uh, and then you want to quantify its behavior. And uh, to a good approximation, the worm is a, a one-dimensional object. So you can approximate its posture simply by finding out the midline. right? And uh, temporal dynamics of this midline is going to inform you about the worm's behavior. Now, uh, this is not uh, very difficult usually, but if you want to do it accurately, and specifically when the worms misbehave, it is quite a challenging problem in image analysis. And what helps you is, uh, you don't have to really read this, but just get a kind of a sense of it. What helps you is a, a statistical model of your data. and uh, in collaboration with the Alia Meets group at the University of Chicago, we came up with a statistical al algorithm for segmenting worm posture, uh, where something like this. First, we take an image and we identify the edges in the image. Those are the edges. And then based on the edges, we identify the location of features that with high probability are either in the head of the worm or the body of the worm. Then the algorithm searches for solutions for the midline uh, that are, uh, are can be assigned with a high probability given the position of these features. And for computational reasons, it does so twice, first on a coarse grained image and a second round on the original image. And once you're done with all, all of this, uh, you end up with a fairly accurate midline that tells you the position, the posture of the worm in a single frame. And if you collect the time series of these frames, you get a sense of what the worm is doing. So, OK, now we have a midline. What do we do with the midline? So in 2008, uh, it was shown that if you essentially decompose worm midlines to, to, to normal modes, um, called eigen, this is a technical term. Don't laugh. Do <laughs> you, you can look it up. Uh, so, um, right? uh, so the first four or five eigenworms uh, actually explain most of the variability in worm behavior. And you think about it, it has very simple mechanical reasons, uh, but it's been shown. So if you want to do an unbiased um, uh, analysis of behavior, you can project, for instance, uh, worm postures on these uh, uh, subspaces of these eigenworms. Uh, and uh, you know, it helps you uh, study various things. We, we, we can do that as well. But perhaps more importantly, it shows you that the problem is inherently low dimensional. So um, even if you do low dimensional heuristics, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, you're, you're probably OK. You're not missing a lot of information. And so sometimes it's more convenient um, to do something else. So here's a worm. Here's the midline. And what's plotted here, just look on the left, uh, is the temporal dynamics of curvatures at fixed points along the midline of the worm. So this brown curve is the curvature as it changes in time uh, near the head. This red curve is probably the curvature over here. The yellow curve is in the midbody, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if you're, uh, or what you can see is that peaks in curvature in this piece of data, this is real data, by the way, not a simulation or anything, uh, travel from the head to the tail. Uh, so if peaks of curvature travel from the head to the tail, the worm is reptating forward. Right? So this is data from a forward-moving worm. And um, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but the fact is that this is data from a sleeping worm. And you know, the, the, the biggest telltale, right? the, the biggest sign is uh, these periods of quiescence, where it doesn't matter where in the worm you look, uh, curvature is constant, because the worm is not moving. So this is a bout of quiescence, and this is a bout of motion, where curvature changes with time. And what this looks like, 
at least uh, naively, is um, like a two-state process. There are two states. There's the quiescent state, and there is the motion state, and the worm hops back and forth between them. Uh, and a natural first question to ask would be, is this process Markovian? Do the worms remember what they did before? Uh, does that affect, say, the duration uh, of these bouts? And the answer is uh, definitely uh, this process is not Markovian, but also in an interesting way. So suppose that you take all the pairs of bouts of quiescence and motion. So, sorry, bouts of motion followed by bouts of quiescence, right? And suppose that you sort these pairs by the duration of the bout of motion, and then for any given duration of bout of motion, you average the bouts of quiescence. And you plot the data, you can see an upward trend. Or in other words, you can see a linear correlation, which tells you that if the worm moved for a longer time, right after that it was quiescent for a longer time on average. Or I guess we can summarize it with this cartoon. So in this cartoon, think about the first red row as a bout of motion. The more I walk along it, uh, the longer I move, if I'm a worm, during sleep. And these blue columns are bouts of quiescence. So the longer the bout of motion, the longer the following bout of quiescence, but not vice versa. So the duration of a bout of quiescence is in no way a predictor of the duration of the next bout of motion. So what this looks like, at least in the correlation sense, is that quiescence compensates during worm sleep for the motion that really uh, just happened uh, a minute ago. Okay, but we want to push this forward. We want to go from correlation to causation, and in order to do so, we have to perturb the system, and it has to respond in some kind of logical manner, right? Um, so we built this. Uh, basically, we perturb the system by coupling the worms to a buzzer uh, that operates at one kilohertz. Uh, the mechanical coupling is done by gluing the, buzzle, the, the buzzer to a plastic uh, homemade clamp. The clamp clamps onto the dish in which the worm is. Uh, and uh, we operate it at a fixed amplitude and a fixed frequency, one kilohertz, but we vary the duration of the pulse. So a very weak nudging uh, to worm sleep uh, would be basically giving it a half a second pulse. A slightly stronger shake uh, would, con would be, uh, let's say, uh, a pulse, what did we use? Uh, a 10 second pulse of vibrations. Okay, so we can control the severity of the disruption and we can see what the worm, uh, what the worm does. An important point here is that we repeat, to get statistics, we repeat this procedure every 15 minutes. So if the worm sleeps for three hours, it gets on average 12 uh, of these pulses and we average all the data together and because we average all this data together our time axis essentially has periodic boundary conditions uh, right a minute before one pulse is 14 minutes after the other pulse etc so uh, our time is uh, circular and then we, we perform two experiments we perturb them with half a second pulses and with 10 second pulses and we see two different things when we very weakly nudge the worm uh, Okay, suppose that these gray lines are the quiescent, they correspond to quiescent levels of worms that are not disturbed. Uh, if we very weakly nudge the worms, they lose quiescence for a bit, and then they compensate locally. Essentially, right after the pulse, they prolong the quiescent bout. All right, and that's all that happens. However, if we give them a stronger stimulus, they lose quiescence for a, for a few minutes, up to five minutes, and they don't compensate locally. Rather, what happens is the shift from the unperturbed baseline is, is larger. So during those three hours, whenever we're not nudging them, they're actually more quiescent. They're sleeping more deeply, if you want. So this is essentially what I'm going to tell you. And the data looks something like this. Uh, doesn't fit in the screen, but it doesn't really matter. Um, OK. On the left here, this is a plot of an awake worm, and everything that's important about the plot actually fits on the stream. On the right, these are sleeping worms. On the left, the blue line designates forward motion, and you can see that a half a second pulse of vibrations is a weak stimulus because there is some response, but it's pretty meager. After less than a minute, it's all over. Uh, they jerk forward a little bit on average. However, the quiescent worms, 
uh, what they do with the same stimulus, they lose quiescence for a fraction of a minute, and then they prolong the next quiescent bout. So they compensate locally, like before. <coughs> and uh, this, is this is very different from what happens uh, with a strong stimulus, okay? So first let's convince ourselves that 10 seconds is a stronger stimulus. You can look at the awake worm and you can see that instead of this meager response, the response on average actually takes 15 minutes almost to go back to baseline. So they move forward for quite a while after 10 second vibrations. Now compare these two, you can see that in the case of sleeping worms that are strongly perturbed, they lose quiescence for a while, but they don't compensate locally. Instead, this red line is elevated, and you can see that here, sort of, because the red and the beige lines no, no longer overlay, right? And remember the periodic boundary conditions here. So this is not before the stimulus, this is after the last stimulus. But this baseline quiescence away from the stimulus is higher than here. And you can, of course, you can summarize this. You can average the quiescence here, and you can satisfy yourself that this is a very robust effect. It's very reproducible, and it's very significant, despite the fact that it's a little small. OK, so in biology, other sciences as well, uh, you see something like this, and it's uh, customary or polite to say something about the molecular machinery that underlies it. And that has two reasons. Uh, the first reason is if you have another knob, and that knob in this case is genetics that you can turn, and the system responds in a way that you can explain, it bolsters your confidence in the results. Uh, they don't seem random. They don't seem so artifactual. But perhaps a more important reason is that if you know something about a specific piece of molecular machinery that goes into making this thing tick, uh, then probably the same piece of machinery was studied elsewhere in another context, in other animals, right? And then um, that just opens the door to the next set of questions and to a deeper understanding of, of the phenomena. And so uh, now I'm going to drag you through the, I think, minimal amount of biology necessary um, to basically make this point. And I'm going to talk about two uh, pieces of molecular machineries. The first thing is, uh, Neuropeptides, so these are these dark dots here and here and here. And they're essentially small, diffusible molecules, they're peptides, as the name suggests, uh, that neurons tend to secrete in order to uh, regulate the action of nervous systems on usually low spatiotemporal resolutions. So uh, it's not as acute as a connection, a synaptic connection between two neurons, uh, but they just float there and kind of modulate the action of the system. And this is not something particular to the worm. All animals have them. And just as a, an, an anecdote, the number of neuropeptides used by worms in humans even is, is actually quite similar. It's in the low hundreds, uh, a little less than 300 if memory serves. So all animals use them. All animals use pretty similar versions of them. Uh, and all animals, in all animals, they tend to have similar functions. So because the worm is a great genetic organism, you can do the following trick. You can deprive the worm of either the use of all the neuropeptides or a subset of neuropeptides. All is a little trickier. But uh, anyway, um, if we do that, if we deprive the worm of the use of a specific set of neuropeptides, what we see is that it can no longer locally compensate for weak disturbances. So we give it the same half a second pulse and nothing happens in terms of the com compensation. It does feel the pulse, so it does start moving even if it's asleep, but it doesn't compensate. And in fact, even if you look at the freely behaving worms that we didn't disturb at all, and you remember those correlations between bouts of motion and consecutive bouts of quiescence, those correlations are almost gone without the same subset of neuropeptides. However, however, if you give them the 10 second pulse, that is the stronger uh, stimulus, they compensate just fine. This is not the local compensation, this is the elevation of baseline away from the stimulus, but it's not at all damaged. So this subset of neuropeptides is required specifically for stabilizing this global state uh, in the face of low noise. Okay, not for strong noise. So there has to be something responsible uh, also for compensation in the face of stronger noise. 
And uh, turns out that, well, at least to the best of our knowledge, it's a completely different beast, not a neuropeptide at all. So uh, this is the one acronym or the one name, gene name, that protein name, uh, that I'm going to leave here, uh, uh, or I'm going to uh, leave in this talk, basically, uh, because it's very important. Uh, what we want to know about it is that, A, it's not at all a neuropeptide. Uh, for those interested, it's a transcription factor, a completely different thing. But you can think about it as a, as a protector in the following sense. When the worm is assaulted by high temperature, by uh, 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 pathological bacteria, by a toxin, uh, many, many times, more often than not, this DAF16 guy that lives everywhere in the cell shuttles itself into the nucleus of the cell and there it activates a protective genetic program. So the worm senses an assault and it sends this protector into the nucleus to activate uh, a protection program and there are many protection program. It has, I don't know, a thousand targets uh, and it really depends on the assault. Uh, what kind of protection program it will, uh, it will activate. And what's more, these are images of sleeping worms where DAF16 was labeled with a green fluorescent dye and you can see that it's nowhere near the nucleus. You, you can hardly see it at all because it's everywhere. But if you take a metal wire and poke the sleeping worms manually, uh, then it shuttles into the nucleus and activates some unknown protective program. So disturbing worm sleep is stressful for the worm. And again, this DAF16, this is not an anecdotal worm protective mechanism. It essentially exists in every animal and uh, its function is really similar in, I would say, many, many animals. Okay, so this is a, a very, very uh, ubiquitous uh, piece of biological logic, if you want. So what does DAF16 do in our experiments? Well, if you don't disturb the worms at all, look here on the left, uh, the correlations between quiescent bounds and motion bounds are, are there. The data is a little bit noisy. This is pretty common for mutants. Mutants are always a little messed up in some nonspecific way. Importantly, if you turn on low noise, the half second uh, vibration pulses, then everything seems to be fine. Quiescence is elevated right after the pulse and they can compensate locally just fine. However, the ability to compensate for the 10 second stronger stimulus goes away completely. So here you can see that the red line and the beige line after a strong stimulus are <coughs> on top of each other again. And uh, here is the average data. This is just a bar graph of the same data showing you that whether you perturb it or don't perturb it at all or perturb it weakly or perturb it strongly, it doesn't matter. The baseline does not shift. Anyway, it does not shift upwards, I should say. Okay, so DAF16 is important for compensating for stronger stimuli and your peptides are for weaker stimuli. But of course we can push this forward. Like we know definitely from ourselves, from human subjects that voluntarily or involuntarily were deprived of sleep, that we can push, we can deprive an animal of sleep beyond the point that it can compensate for. Essentially make it have a really bad night. And so what happens then? So like I said, there is a lot of data in vertebrates and specifically in humans. On the left here is an iconic picture of uh, brain scans of people taken from two groups, uh, a well-rested group and a sleep-deprived group. Uh, and what these people were asked to do uh, was essentially to perform some simple cognitive function. So uh, sit around and while their brain is being scanned, uh, solve a math problem, something like that. And you don't really have to be an expert to see that uh, the well-rested group is happier. Brain function is uh, deficient here. There's less going on, right? They're sillier, effectively. So sleep loss, and it's been known for a while, uh, of course, impairs brain function. Like I said, it's worse in children and infants. Um, it's, it, quote unquote, gets better with old age. Uh, and we know that about many vertebrates, including humans. Surprisingly, uh, for simple model systems, for invertebrates in general, there is far less data uh, that shows that something similar happens. 
And in fact, for invertebrate model systems, flies and worms, uh, there is only one paper that I'm aware of, and it only came out last year from the lab of Amita Segal and UPenn, where they sleep deprived flies late in development, these are young adult flies, and they saw that a certain region in the fly brain was smaller, it didn't develop properly as compared to the control group, and correspondingly these flies were for days after deficient in uh, a, a certain behavior that flies perform, mating behavior. Okay, and what about worms? If you deprive worms of sleep sufficiently, uh, would they show long-term deficits? Uh, this question is, a there's no published data on this question, that's what I should say. And so, in order to address this question, what you have to do is first figure out how to deprive worms of a significant fraction of their sleep, and, and this is an annoyingly tricky problem. Because like I showed you before, if you are too gentle with the worms, they fight you back, they compensate, and nothing happens. So you say, okay, let's go brute force on them, let's give them all we got. And then again nothing happens because, uh, I guess a, a loose analogy would be somebody sleeping next to an airport. If it's a noisy environment, at some point, uh, you, right, you just ignore it. You just ignore the noise and sleep anyway. And that's what the worms do. If you try to disturb them too harshly, they'll just ignore you. So that doesn't work. Uh, fortunately, there's a, a middle ground. And uh, one of the conditions that we found that uh, belongs to this middle ground, to this intermediate regime, is a very annoying stimulus. It's a square wave with a period of six minutes and a duty cycle of 50 seconds that goes on for hours. And so the buzzer goes on for three minutes and then off for three minutes and on for three minutes and off for three minutes and the worm can never really get used to it. So they, they move, they don't move, they move, they don't move, it really annoys them. And it annoys everybody. <laughs> it's an extremely annoying experiment. Okay, but uh, anyway, the, the important thing is that uh, suppose you judge worm sleep by the amount that they don't move, the amount of total quiescence. You can see that A, this regime deprives the worms of 50 to 60 percent of their sleep by this measure. And B, which is, is kind of nice, it affects normal worms and mutant worms <coughs> more or less similarly. So there, there aren't gross differences between the two. So now we have a method of depriving worms of sleep in a non-lethal way. We don't kill them because we don't deprive them of 100 percent of their sleep, but they do have a really bad night. And the question is, okay, suppose you did this, what do you measure? What do you compare? You know, you have your tired group and you have your well-rested group, what do you compare? Obviously you can't ask the worms math question, that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> There's going to be no difference in performance there. Uh, but, um, but yeah, but the worms can do so many things. The worms can locomote. That's actually a highly coordinated uh, circuit that, that governs that. that, that could be that could go wrong. They can navigate gradients, positive gradients or negative gradients. They can learn. They can associate different cues with each other. They <laughs> defecate regularly every minute. They reproduce a lot. Each worm can have up to 300 children in three days. Okay, so that's a good one maybe. Uh, and they feed, obviously. They wouldn't have energy if they didn't feed. Uh, so how do you choose? And you know, I, I don't have a, a definitive answer, but the thing that guided us was to try to find subsystems, if you want, of the worm that are fairly isolated, they have a clear output, and that the output is, is simple. And start there, and see what happens. And luckily, I guess, you can't throw a dead cat without fun finding something wrong uh, with a sleep-deprived worm. So um, you don't have to be too careful about your choices. But anyway, uh, because of this uh, search for simplicity, uh, the first thing we ended up looking at was uh, the pharynx, and the pharynx is a pump, all right? So the worm feeds on bacteria that are immersed in liquid. And it has an organ, this is the pharynx here in green, uh, along the head of the worm. And this organ is composed essentially of a group of muscles and about 20 neurons, exactly 20 neurons. And its sole purpose is to pump in food. So it needs to pump in the liquid with the bacteria, spit out the liquid, and swallow the bacteria. And when it's going at full rate, it looks something like this. So for a sense of scale, the width of this worm is about 40 microns, uh, and this is the end of the pharynx, the bulb, and this is the grinder moving up and down. So this motion is a few microns. 
uh, this movie is slowed down. Uh, the full or the, the fastest rate that it can go is up to five hertz, more or less. Uh, and it operates uh, all the time. Every time the worm needs to eat, it needs to pump in food using the pharynx. The other nice thing about the pharynx is that it's isolated from the rest of the worm and it's pretty autonomous. If you pop it out of the worm, it will go on pumping, unlike your heart, for instance. Um, so, okay, so seems like a good candidate to play with. And um, the thing is, th this is how uh, things are still done. This is not a historical survey. Uh, this is how pumping is scored. Somebody takes a movie, much like the movie that I showed you, and uh, they sit around for 30 seconds with a clicker, and, and they score by eye how many pumps, and then they divide it by 30 seconds, and they get a mean rate, which is a questionable measure of pumping. And anyway, uh, I mean, it, it's a good measure for some purposes, but for the purpose of the experiments that I'm going to describe, it was completely inadequate. And in collaboration with the Relevine's lab at Harvard University, we developed a method for automatically uh, scoring pumping. And so uh, the trick goes as follows. Uh, you take um, a fast movie. We image at about 60 hertz. I think a rel image is at about 50 hertz. Uh, and what you calculate uh, much like the talk that we heard here two weeks ago, is the difference image. I guess much like in astrophysics. So we subtract consecutive images from each other. And then uh, if, you, uh, if there is no motion between the two consecutive frames, and you look at the intensity of the pixels of the difference image, what you see is a big peak around zero. Most pixels have the same values in both images. However, if the grinder moved a little bit, between two consecutive images, then you see a big peak of zero intensities in the difference image, but also a few high intensity pixels. So you see two peaks, one big peak near zero and a smaller peak at the uh, tail of the distribution. And then uh, the trick is to calculate the entropy of the difference image, uh, essentially giving larger weights to the tail of the distribution. And if you do that, you get these stereotypical peaks that uh, are associated with single pumping motions and a computer can automatically tag. So now we can automatically tag uh, pumping events and we, we get these time series. We're no longer confined to 30 second or one minute movies. We can do this for hours. And typically in our experiment, we wait for an hour. And, and that's not a bad thing because this time series is not exactly simple. It has correlations on a variety of time scales. Uh, it, it's complicated in many ways, but um, Perhaps the first thing you notice about it is that, at the very least, again, it has two states. It has the on state where the worm pumps at four hertz very regularly. And uh, for lack of a better name, it has the on state where the worm mostly does not pump, but sporadically it does something. All right? So this is what, it what the data looks like. Um, all right. What else do you notice? The first experiment that we did, uh, actually concurrently, both in our lab and in Arel's lab, is uh, use a microfluidic <laughs> device that uh, uh, Arel's postdoc uh, developed and measure pumping rates or maybe pumping distributions um, in the presence of controls, controlled amounts of food. So we take various food concentrations varying from extremely low to quite high and we subject the worm to this constant environment and we see how they pump. And, uh, okay, you get a distribution of pumping rates. Uh, this is distribution at low concent very low concentration. This is at quite high concentration. And whether you look at the average rate or the duty ratio between the on and off state, uh, you see two things immediately. A, the worm feeds faster or more uh, the more food there is. This is a somewhat unintuitive result from the perspective of humans, but from the perspective of worms, it's perfectly fine. Uh, pumping costs. Pumping has an energetic cost and um, if there's good food around now, that's not a good reason to assume that there's going to be good food 10 minutes from now because maybe there's other creatures that will grab it. And so the worm strategy is the better the food, the faster to take it in and store it as fat. That's what the worm does. The other thing you can almost see in this graph, not quite, but this food concentration is very close to zero and in fact even when the food concentration is exactly zero, there's no food, the worm still pumps, which brought forth the idea that the worm pumps for food, but also for information. So it doesn't pump only for food, 
it will be willing to pay the cost of pumping even without food because it gave some insight about its environment. Uh, so again, in collaboration with Aurel, we came up with a model to put this in slightly more quantitative terms. Um, the model treats pumping as a discrete process and essentially says that uh, at any time step, the worm faces a decision to pump or not to pump. Uh, if it pumps, so okay, what does it base its decision on? It has some estimate of the average concentration of food in its, in, in its environment. If with high probability the average concentration of food, the concentration of food is high, it will pump. While doing so, it will get some food or not. It will sample the environment. The sample will allow it to update, to improve its estimate of the environment. So this information gain will feed into the next pumping cycle. The crucial point about this model is that even if the worm doesn't pump, it cannot assume that its environment is stationary. Maybe things have changed. So if it doesn't pump and doesn't sample the environment, its estimation of the environment still changes. It degrades slowly towards the naive estimation of I don't know anything. If it doesn't pump for a long time, it doesn't know anything. Now because bacteria are discrete, uh, and because we're talking about small volumes, uh, we assume that at a given concentration theta, the worm uh, with every pump gets a sample X of a certain number of bacteria. That's Poisson distributed around theta. And this is the update rule, and it will make sense in a second. Uh, this update rule has become very, very simple if you model the worm's estimate of the environment using a, uh, a gamma function. Uh, and the reason is, is that if you multiply this gamma function by the Poisson distribution, essentially what you're doing is changing alpha around this parameter here by the amount of your sample. So pumping decisions basically boil down to a random walk in the parameter alpha. And now there's a whole other side of how does the worm forget or relax its distribution of, of concentrations uh, when it doesn't pump, and I'm not going to talk about that, that's very much work in progress, but essentially suppose the worm does pump, you know, here's an example of how it works. So suppose that there is no food, okay, but the worm is unaware of that. Uh, basically it, it goes through the three stages of worm grief. Uh, it starts with a pretty naive estimate of the world, so it's in denial, thinks maybe there's food out there. Uh, the probability that the concentration of food is high is denoted here in yellow. It's, it's pretty high. There's no reason not to pump. So if pump once, but there's no food, it doesn't get any food. It moves from denial to bargaining. It updates its estimate of the world. The probability that the concentration of food is high is, is lower, but still substantial. It's still bargaining. Maybe it didn't get food because of a fluctuation, right? So it's going to pump again. And this time, not getting food for the second time, shifts us from bargaining to acceptance. Now its view of the world is pretty bleak. The chances that there's a high concentration of food is essentially zero, uh, not worth pumping anymore. And so the next step, not plotted here, would will not pump, but this estimate of the world is not going to stay stationary. It's going to slowly degrade in a way that we have to prescribe back to the naive estimation if it keeps on not pumping. All right, so this is how the model works. And What's good in, uh, about this model is that it actually captures all the features that I showed you in the data and more. So there is a lot of, not a lot, uh, there, there's quite a few detailed features of the data uh, that this simple model captures and allows us to conceptualize and think about. All right, so now we have everything. Now we can measure pumping, we can analyze the, the images, uh, we can conceptualize the data, and, and we can go to town. This is just three examples from a long series of examples of the same experiment. We take worms that we either didn't manipulate at all or maybe manipulated in some way. We divide them into two groups. One group is the control group, they're well rested. The other group is the sleep deprived group. Uh, and we can compare the pumping rates between the two. And you know, you get dozens essentially of these histograms uh, and you start looking at them and there are differences but it's kind of complicated. So usually the um, well-rested group has a nicer peak around four or five hertz. Uh, it's a little diminished here. If you focus, if you zoom in on the low end tail of the distribution, it's usually much more substantial in the sleep deprived worm. You can see this nicely here. Uh, so depriving worm of sleep does have 
grave consequences for feeding, uh, but you know, how, how, how do you summarize such data? And so currently we're looking at three measures. Uh, the first measure is not, the first statistic I should say, is not very, um, not very sensitive, but it, you know, it makes sense to plot it anyway. This is just the average pumping rate. So dark bars are well-rested worms, light bars are sleep-deprived worm, blue bars are normal worms, and green and uh, orange bars are worms that don't have the same protector, DAF16, uh, functional in them. And what you can see is that at least by this measure, uh, wild-type worms, uh, normal worms, they're not really uh, heavily impacted by sleep loss, but if you take away the ability of the worm to protect itself against severe deprivation by removing DAF16, then they suffer a loss. Uh, a slightly more refined measurement is the persistence of the on state. And you see that this is basically what gets damaged. It's the on state that gets hammered by sleep deprivation, um, especially if you take away the worm's ability to defend itself. If you deprive it of sleep, it can't latch on to the on state. It can't just persist with it uh, for long periods of time. And another um, I think quite natural and, and, and quite sensitive measure that you could use is, is the relative entropy or the Kolbe-Kleibler divergence, uh, which uh, is basically, uh, okay, let's go back. It basically goes as follows. So it's an information-like measure, and suppose that you wanted to approximate the well-rested histogram with the deprived histogram, right? You would suffer some kind of information loss because this is just an approximation and basically the relative entropy is that, that information loss in bits if you, lose, if you use um, log 2 here. And so you can see here that uh, the distribution of pumping rates of normal worms are not identical between sleep deprived and, and, and well rested animals but if you remove the protector DAF16 this difference grows meaning that um, if you move the ability of the worm to protect itself against uh, uh, sleep deprivation, then the consequences are graver. So I want to move on to conclusions. Uh, but before that, I, I just want to give you a flavor of a, of a slightly different thing that we're doing and uh, very related. And it, it really is ongoing, so there's not much results here. It's just kind of a conceptual, um, I guess, introduction to what's going on now. Um, if you remember the list from a few slides ago, obviously feeding is not the only thing the worms do, right? Uh, so another very simple system with a very clear function that's important to every animal on the planet is the reproductive system. Worms reproduce, people reproduce, mouse, mice, rats, birds, everything reproduces. And the reproductive system of the worm is particularly nice. From the point of view of the nervous system, the egg-laying circuit in the worm is extremely simple. There are essentially three important neurons. This is the red one, HSN, and these two yellow ones. Uh, basically, these are the important players. Uh, moreover, this circuit wires itself exactly during the time of sleep that we are perturbing. And so, if you want to ask yourself, does sleep deprivation uh, play a role in the proper wiring of, nervous or of neural circuits, this is an ideal candidate to look at. It really does reorganize itself exactly when the worm is sleeping. <coughs> um, there are several ways to look at a neural circuit. Um, all of these are made much easier by the wonderful genetics of the worm. One way is to simply label this neuron with a fluorescent marker that fluoresces more intensely when the neuron is active. And just follow the fluorescence of the neuron. So this is this movie here. This is the neuron. This is the average fluorescence in the neuron. I'll run it twice in a minute. I'll show you why. But basically, the reason you don't see much of Saudi the neuron is because, because of genetics, you can specifically label the neuron. There's a freely behaving worm here, uh, but it's pretty dark because it's not labeled. And what you can see is that there is some physiological activity in this neuron. And actually, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'll, I'll try to run this again. And, uh, oh, if I can. And you'll see that when activity peaks, right? Normally, you can just see the um, normally you can just see the cell body, but when activity peaks, you can actually see other parts of the neurons. So let's uh, let's try to run this again. So here is the cell body, and you see this. 
the neuron is active, all of a sudden different parts of it are becoming visible. Uh, and this is going to happen twice. All right, so that's one way to look at neuronal activity. It's going to happen again right now. Here, I don't know if you noticed. Um, another way to look at neurons using a different genetic trick is to make them photo excitable, photo activable. So you can engineer a neuron that wasn't like that to be activable by blue photons. And then if you do that to this red egg laying neuron, uh, you essentially can shine blue light and the worm will pop out eggs. And then you can sleep deprive the worms or not sleep deprive the worms, shine blue light and see if they pop less eggs out when they're tired. Uh, and uh, preliminarily I would say yes, the tired worms pop out less eggs when you activate the egg laying neuron. And before I conclude, I want to make one last remark and tie it back to what I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, to that question about whether sleep is just for the brain. And I, I hinted, the answer is no, and this is known not only from worms, but in worms it's actually very easy to find out. So another aspect of reproduction is um, really the whole uh, gamut side of the story. The whole, uh, right, the worm is a hermaphrodite. It produces 300 children by essentially making 300 sperms and fertilizing its own 300 eggs, right? And because the worm is optically transparent, it's a very easy experiment to fluorescently label each sperm, put it on a confocal microscope and count. And so we can sleep deprive the worms or not sleep deprive the worms, and we can count sperm. <coughs> and it turns out that tired worms have a lower sperm count than non-tired worms. And, and that's very important, when you remove DAF16, it gets worse. Okay, this is the relative count. So again, if you remove the ability of the worm to protect itself, the sperm count goes even lower. And this is not unique to worms either. This was observed last year and this year in ra rats and mice. Lower sperm count for sleep deprived vertebrates. And I don't know the answer in humans, but I suspect it's the same, just for your information. Um, so, um, so yeah, so a completely different tissue. And it's very easy to use the same experimental tools and look there as well. Uh, much harder with more complicated animals. All right, so let's summarize. So first, uh, what I told you that is that lethargis, which is the technical name for worm sleep, uh, is indeed a sleep-like state. Everything I showed you uh, that wasn't known before adds to the ever-growing list of similarities between worm sleep and human sleep. And in fact, you can reverse the statement because these worms were around, or our common ancestors with these worms, date back 800 million years, almost a billion years ago. Uh, and so evolutionarily speaking, it may well have been that this convoluted molting sleep state came first, probably it came first, and sleep evolved from that. So human sleep may be a molting-like state. That's a thought that upsets some people, but uh, I thought I'd leave you with that. Um, the second part of the talk, I told you something that in retrospect, I mean, the details are not trivial, but in retrospect, the, the principle is, is, is trivial. Any system, any physical system at all that uh, is tasked with maintaining a global state cannot possibly assume that the environment's going to be perfect. It has to have some way to regulate noise. And so in the face of small perturbations, it has to be able to stabilize itself somehow. Otherwise, you know, boats would capsize right and left. Uh, and eventually, if you ramp up the noise in the environment, there's going to be a crossover to, to a more aggressive response. And that's exactly what I showed you in the context of homeostatic compensation. I also showed you for the first time uh, that non-lethal deprivation, serious deprivation of sleep in worms has lasting deficits. I talked more about feeding, but there's also deficits to reproduction, the sperm count at the end. And that DAF16 plays a role in protecting the worm against sleep deprivation. And again, this is not random. Um, a, it tells us that our results are meaningful because they repeat in a logical way, but B, DAF16 is, like I said, in every animal, and it's been exhaustively studied in uh, the context of heat shocks and toxic uh, you know, assaults on the worm and pathological bacteria and whatnot. So we know a lot about that, and identifying that it has to do with sleep loss opens the door to uh, uh, further studies. And the final thought I'll leave you with is this. Um, I told you that sleep has to do with development. 
and I told you that sleep is to first order universal in the animal kingdom and the thought that I can't prove but it, it, it's actually kind of an interesting thought I think is that maybe this is not a coincidence maybe there is a causal relation there and so developing let's focus on the brain for a minute developing a brain is uh, I guess what goes in in biology for a, a almost a scale-free problem in the following sense the worm has to develop a brain from one cell to its full size and so does any other animal every animal starts from one cell so it has to develop a hundred percent of its brain uh, in a limited amount of time and it cannot prolong the duration of development forever there's hell to pay if you prolong the duration of development so every animal it's a universal constraint every animal has to develop hundred percent of its brain uh, in a limited amount of time doesn't matter if it has 302 neurons or hundred billion neurons and if we somebody else somebody can show that having at least two states sleep and awake maybe more states is uh, an integral part of the solution is a very very good way uh, to deal with this universal constraint uh, then basically what they're going to show is that the universal constraint causes uh, the ubiquity of sleep. So, the work I talked about was done by Mark from Yali's group, Stas, Jared, and Monica from my group. And I want to thank my collaborators, the fan funding agencies, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. If what? Alertness. Alertness That's uh, which can be modulated by drugs, uh, which are that, that, That's a very good question. And I, I should qualify my answer by uh, stating that I'm not a sleep medicine expert. Um, OK, so, so sleep is a, is a different state of consciousness. Uh, there. Uh, there are different stages of sleep. So REM sleep is actually a different state of consciousness from, non, from slow wave sleep. And so you can't really talk about opposites. Uh, but to some extent, to some simplistic extent, yes. Uh, alertness, I mean, yes in the sense that uh, sensory gating, in the sense of you know, how you regulate your responses, these are all on opposite ends of this scale, if, if that answers your question. Uh, it's a long discussion, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you had some proposition for a model explaining how it makes some decision about eating or not eating. Yeah. Is there any chance to really find the circuit of the, how the decision happens while it happens? That this decision way from here and this, you know, this actual circuit does this decision. Is there any hope? So in some sense, it's a great question. In some sense, this really depends on aesthetics in the following way. Uh, the answer... Uh, if you're satisfied with a certain level of answers, then yes. And there are simpler examples than pumping where uh, essentially a decision, if you will, was pinned down to a single neuron or, or a, a memory or something like that, or learning, even to a subcompartment. However, if you want to be very rigorous, then um, the physical correlates of information in nervous systems they're an extremely tricky thing to define. And um, I'm not talking about models, I'm talking about the physical, like figuring out where a packet of information, what actually physically manifests it, that's extremely tricky. And if you want to get quantitative, it's, a, it's an interesting open question. Uh, actually, it's a very ancient open question. Uh, if you look up the word engram for memory, you know, people were bothered with this question for uh, about 120 years now, I guess. Um, so the answer is, um, I don't know of a very, very crisp example that finds you know, the physical manifestation uh, of information all the way. Uh, there are some examples in more advanced nervous system of coding that you more or less understand the code. But even that uh, is, is sketchy. If you have the access to all the neurons and all the genetics, isolating something like this, that, that, would, be, that would be great. But it hasn't really been done. Uh, to 100% satisfaction. Yeah. 
are all worms people? Like mm. Also great. Do worms have personality? I think that's what you're asking, right? Um, no, all worms are not equal, uh, and there is always variance there. Um, in the context of sleep, all worms that we looked at are rather similar. Uh, you know that they're different, A, because there are finite error bars and everything, but also as soon as you do a genetic manipulation, variance goes up. Um, so, okay, the simple answer is no. We have not, and others have not either, paid enough attention to the variance to assign meaning to this variability. Uh, there are tools, and a lot of people for 10 years now are saying that this is an interesting problem. They should look at it. I, you know, I'm a culprit too. Uh, but somehow nobody gets around to it. Um, you know, th the machinery is on a fundamental level stochastic. It's a finite number of molecular players that are there in varying numbers. And uh, the best references, or the best reviews, I guess, that you can get on this subject precisely is to the work of Eve Martyr from Brandeis University, who studies this not in the worm, but in the crab. Uh, and, and really looks at how the variability of the machinery and the variability of the emerging behavior uh, uh, interplay. It's, it's a very serious subject of research. Hasn't been done a lot in worms. Sure. Larger time scales of, of app. Oh, oh, I. I mean, uh, you mean uh, deficits that last for longer, or. He, he said he said that the compensation, uh, like fine tuning. Uh, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically to know, I, I have to say we don't know, because to know the answer to that, if I get your question, uh, you'd have to really study the crossover, or you, you'd have to really well define the time scales. Uh, and all we could uh, do is sample, you know, three time scales. Basically the one minute time scale, the one hour time scale, and the one day time scale. And I don't, th I don't think that those three points give enough information to give an accurate answer there. Um, so I don't, I mean, an answer must exist. There's nothing magical about the worms, but I don't know the precise answer. All right.